Hello and welcome. I think it's time to make another repair video and if you don't mind today I'd like to present one really interesting issue. I never had something like this before so I am very excited as well. Maybe you remember this 386SX mainboard which I used for overclocking experiments. Unfortunately this mainboard was not very cooperative as I tried to clock the CPU above 25 MHz. But still, I really like this mainboard. First of all, because I repaired and modified it already many times, and meanwhile it feels very familiar. But also because I use it as a slow test platform for a various hardware. And furthermore, it is kind of special because it accepts simultaneous usage of SIM and deep memory, which allows to use, for example, 5 MB of RAM. It was very unusual back then, and if this board would be able to handle higher frequencies, it would be really awesome. Anyway, let me show you what's wrong with it. Some time ago I was working on one of my projects, and I used this mainboard for testing. I didn't do anything special actually, just some signal measurements on an ISA card. Suddenly the system became very slow. It worked actually kind of reliably, at least I didn't notice any functional issues, but the system became super unresponsive. Let me start Phil's benchmark pack. You already can see how slowly the display was redrawn. Let's take a look at the landmark speed test. And look at that, CPU clock was recognized as 1.387 MHz, despite that this machine is a 16 MHz 386SX. Also down here, look how weird the scale jumps up and down between something around 12 MHz and some values below scale. And up there, the speed behaves also super strange. I will not even try to show you any game, since it takes forever to start one. Like 15 minutes to get, for example, Commander Keen running. Believe me, it is not because the turbo is off or some trivial thing. There is something wrong with this board. So let's see what it could be. If you follow my channel, you know that for my repairs, I try to use simple equipment as much as possible. But this time, I think I will need an oscilloscope to find out what's going on. First, I would like to check out the crystal oscillators and see if they all generate proper frequencies. I can see here are two and another one is up there. First of all, if you use an oscilloscope for such measurements, don't forget to switch it to the 10 times mode. I have a switch on the probe for that and um, on the oscilloscope I have a switch as well. Both must be set to 10x. The reason is that the crystal oscillators generate a very weak signal, which will be pulled down by the probe if used in a normal mode. In that case, neither will you be able to measure anything, nor will your system continue to work properly, since the oscillator would be disturbed too much. By 10x, an additional resistor in the probe will be activated, and so the probe pulls down the signal 10 times weaker as in normal mode. Anyway, first of all, let's see what we get on the main oscillator, which supplies the frequency for the CPU. As I told, the 386SX on this mainboard is a 16 MHz version, which must be supplied with the doubled frequency, or 32 MHz. And as you see, it seems to work properly. Let's see if it arrives at the CPU itself. The datasheet tells that the clock input is on the pin 15. Let's see what we get there. And uh, there are 32 MHz as well, so the CPU should at least run at the right speed. Okay, this crystal oscillator up here has an inscription 8000 on it. I guess that means 8 MHz. I'm currently not sure what this crystal is responsible for exactly, but looks like it delivers 8 MHz indeed, so I assume it is alright. The next one should deliver 14.3 MHz and is probably the general purpose clock, which goes among others to the ISA bus. And also here everything seems to be in limits. During my overclocking experiments I realized that there was a crack in the old caps at this oscillator. I replaced them back then and I thought that the problem could be here around, but it looks good so far. The next crystal oscillator is here, near the keyboard controller. 
such a small cylinder is usually a 32 kilohertz oscillator which is used for the real-time clock generator. On the old main boards it is usually placed somewhere near the battery since the oscillator has to run from the battery to maintain the time and calendar when the PC is turned off. Hmm. I can't measure anything. There are some sporadic impulses, but that is probably due to my shaky hand. But I don't see any frequency generated by this crystal. Hmm. Nope. I can't measure any clock, neither on one leg nor on the other. Hmm. Let's see where the connections are going to. Following the traces, the crystal oscillator is connected to this Toshiba TC4069 IC. You see, the crystal itself is not a clock generator. Its output is a sinus wave, which has to be converted into a square wave, which can be used then as a clock afterwards. So this IC is an inverter and is basically responsible for conversion of the sinus wave from the crystal into a square wave. Furthermore, it acts as a buffer which enforces the signal and makes it more stable. Well, it's hard to tell now what is going on. My assumption for now is that the crystal oscillator is broken. Let's visit the BIOS and see if the clock is running at all. If this crystal is broken, the clock should not count the seconds. What does this have to do with the strange behavior of the system, you might ask? Well, real-time clock generates interrupts, and a lot of things in an AD system depends on it. If the clock doesn't work, the interrupts will not come, and the operation system could fall into a lot of timeouts and other error states. These can end up in various strange effects. The clock seems to work, but the seconds are counted very unequally. This is odd. Oh, look at that, the seconds stopped at 29 seconds after the boot. So my assumption about the real-time clock is maybe right. I'm not sure if it is the crystal what is broken, but let's replace it and see if we will get any further. And here it is. It has no markings on it, which would tell us what kind of crystal this is. However, as I already mentioned, for the real-time clock usually a 32 kHz crystal is used and this can be found on almost all mainboards. I will salvage a replacement crystal from another dead mainboard in my spare parts box. This main board seems to have what I need. By the way, time goes on, and the old hardware gets more and more expensive. I don't even talk about the retro hardware itself, but about the replacement parts. This crystal is definitely not a good example, but many other parts don't get produced anymore, and they have to be salvaged from scrap. However, meanwhile, even the scrap became incredibly expensive. This is a hobby channel, which should carry the expenses on its own. Unfortunately, it seems not to work anymore, and I feel uncomfortable having to mention it, but if you would like to support my channel, I have a Patreon and a PayPal accounts, which you can use to help me to keep this channel running. So, meanwhile, the replacement crystal is in place. Let's power up the system and see if the clock is ticking properly now. No, that doesn't look good. Now it already stopped after 8 seconds. Well, I didn't check if the replacement crystal is working, but I think the probability that both crystals are broken in the same way is minimal, so there must be something else what is wrong with it. Off camera I made some measurements and the crystal oscillator didn't generate any signal, just as before. However, during my investigation I stumbled upon something interesting. Look what happens when I turn on the power. Right after the power up, our crystal seems to generate proper frequency of 32 kHz, but the amplitude decreases after a while. It starts at about 5 volts peak to peak and falls down to 1.7 volts, where the oscillation stops eventually. Such a behavior looks like a discharging of a capacitor for me. Let me explain what I mean. This is a regular sinus wave, how it should look like, periodically and with always the same amplitude. 
the vertical axis represents the voltage over the time on horizontal axis. The job of a crystal oscillator is to generate such a sinus wave. Our wave's amplitude, on the other hand, seems to decrease over the time and looks more like this. Now, if I draw a line over the local maximums of our wave, I'll get something like this. And this blue line looks very much like a capacitor discharge. I'll have to keep this in mind for the further analysis. I think the crystal is alright, but there is some other oddness around it. First of all, there is this capacitor nearby, which is connected to the crystal. So maybe it is bad and damps the oscillation after a while. Let's replace it by another one and see if it makes any difference. I think I'll also remove the inverter IC and try another one, in case it is not the capacitor. The capacitor has an inscription 22K. I'm actually not sure what capacitance it needs to be. K sounds for me like kilo. 22,000 of what? I guess 22,000 picofarads or 22 nanofarads in other words. Usually the capacitors near such a crystal should be more like 22 picofarad as far as I know. But that K irritates me. Well, I guess I'll try to use 22 nanofarads first. And for the IC, I'll install a socket to be able to swap the IC later, if I need to. Okay, everything is in place. I'll use the same IC for an hour as before, to check out if the capacitor changes anything on the result. I'm measuring now directly on the inverter IC. That is why there is a square wave and not a sinus, as it comes from the crystal. Yeah, and unfortunately nothing has changed. The clock signals flattens and disappears after a while, just as before, so the capacitor didn't change anything on that result. Okay, let's change the IC by another one, which by the way I again got from scrap. Yeah. And nope, the same behavior. So neither the capacitor nor the IC seem to be the culprit. Again, off camera, I made some further investigation, and I think I'm a step further. First of all, I would like to come back to the capacitor. I googled a bit and found that the K in 22K doesn't stand for kilo but for 10% precision. So the capacitor is a 22 picofarad, as I expected it to be from the beginning. Since another capacitor and the crystal didn't change anything, I put back the original parts, just to exclude the possible errors by using wrong values. That's why you see the blue capacitor again back in place. The problem is obviously somewhere else. I'd like to confess an absolute beginner's mistake, which I previously made. I didn't check the voltage on the suspicious TC4069 IC. So a reminder number one. If you have a suspicious part, always check the voltage first. And this is what I found so far. When I turn on the power, the voltage on the named IC rises to 5 volts and then drops down to under 2 volts, resulting in terrible ripple. Let's step back and see how it works. As I said, the frequency for the real-time clock is generated by the crystal oscillator, which swings with 32 kHz. Its sinus wave is then sent through an inverter or buffer, which generates the square wave, which is then sent into the real-time clock I see. On many mainboards, like the one in this video, the real-time clock functionality is integrated directly into the chipset, and in case of dedicated real-time clock IC, the inverter is often integrated into the IC, but this all doesn't play a role now. Important is that to maintain the time and calendar, the crystal, the inverter and the real-time clock IC have to continue to work even if the PC is turned off. 
Therefore, there is a battery on the main board which maintains the power for the slower power components, if needed, even over the years. But when the PC is turned on, there is no need to drain the battery, so there is some smart switching circuitry which detaches the battery and pulls the required power from the power supply. Since the inverter gets its power through the magical switching circuitry, probably the culprit is somewhere there. The circuitry which switches between the battery and the PSU looks always similar to this one. It has two bipolar transistors, usually 3904 and 3906, plus some resistors, diodes and capacitors. Such circuitry is usually located right under the battery and by the way suffers first from a battery leakage. Anyway, to check if there is a problem in the circuitry, I will disconnect the mainboard from the power supply and solder a wire from the battery directly to the TC4069 inverter IC. This way, we will bridge the switching circuitry and hopefully get a steady 3 volt voltage on the IC. Let's see if we will get our clock stable then. And here we go, we have around 3 volts on the VCC of the inverter IC. Aha! Uh -huh. And the crystal delivers steady 32 kHz sinus wave now. That's great! And is a strong sign that the culprit is somewhere in the circuitry for switching between the battery and the power supply. I removed that botch wire again, and a long time ago I modified this mainboard to be able to use a CR2032 battery. Just to be sure, I removed previously installed diode so the board can be now only powered by the PSU. Let's measure the voltage again on the inverter and see if the voltage drop is still the same. Yeah, as you see, it starts at 5 volts and then drops slowly down to 1.7 volts, which is probably too low to keep the clock up and running. What do we have in this area? I already checked all the simple parts, and all the resistors and diodes seem to be alright. There are those two transistors, which can be bad, but since the voltage drops slowly, I still have a feeling that it could be some capacitor. Do you remember this image? Every time you see a voltage slope like this one somewhere, keep an eye on the capacitors. And these two guys here are coincidentally sitting on the trays which goes directly to the VCC pin of the TC4069IC, where I measured the voltage slope. So I think I will start with them, and if they are ok, I will continue with the both transistors. I removed the first capacitor. It is only a bypass capacitor and it is responsible for the voltage stabilization. It is better to have this capacitor in place, but the main board should actually work without it as well. At least for the test round it should be ok. And would you look at that? I guess we found the culprit. The voltage on the inverter is now absolutely stable, at slightly under 5 volts. And what does the crystal oscillator say? Yep, also here we are getting the expected 32 kHz. Perfect! And it was a capacitor indeed. It is a 4.7 microfarad one, and it is suitable for up to 16 volts. Let's test it. At least the tester detects it as a capacitor. You can see it on the C in the end of the line. Yeah, it takes quite a long time, but eventually the tester says that it is faulty. Unfortunately, neither do I have a new one nor did I find a 4.7 microfarad capacitor in my scrap. However, I found here a 6.8 microfarad for up to 25 volts, 
I call it good enough in this case. The tester confirms that it is OK. Tantalum capacitors like this one are polarized, and inserting them wrong way around will end up most certainly in an explosion, so pay attention to the polarity. This tantalum capacitor has a plus on one leg, so the other one is obviously crowned. On the board, there is this white line on one of the contacts, which usually is a ground, but if you are not sure, switch the multimeter into continuity mode and check which one of the contacts is connected to the ground. In this case, the one with the white line is ground indeed, and the other contact is the VCC trace, which goes to the inverter IC as I mentioned before. And here it is, the new green capacitor. The protection diode to the battery is also kept back in place. The inverter IC DC4069 is now socketed. And the original blue capacitor and the crystal are both back where they were. I guess I can now put back the battery as well. Oh, and I will insert 4 megabytes of RAM, which I removed before I started with the repair. As I said, this board can handle deep and SIM memory simultaneously, and I use it with 4 times 1 megabyte SIM and 8 times 128 kilobytes deep modules to get to 5 megabytes of memory in total. So the graphics card and an IDE controller are now back in place and the system is ready for testing. Let's check the voltage on the inverter once again. Yeah, 4.8 volts. Slightly low, but good enough, I guess. Now the frequency on the crystal. 32 kHz. Just perfect. In BIOS, the clock is ticking. We are approaching third minute already. That's fine. But the seconds are ticking slightly weird. Every third second seems to come faster than the other two. I will have to observe it, if this is an issue somehow. Back in DOS, let's see what Landmark speed test has to say now. This looks very promising. CPU clock is at 15.9 MHz and the benchmark is stable at 21.2 points. And look at the clock up here. The seconds seem to tick equally. I guess this was just a refresh issue in BIOS. And the clock is probably working fine, but I will keep an eye on it in the future. Well, the main board seems to work normally now. It is at least as fast as a 16 MHz 386SX can be. But as I said, I use this main board when I need a slower system anyway, so it is just as fast as I need it to be. Honestly, I never had a case like this one before and I found it really interesting. Who would know that the system can become slow because of a faulty capacitor on the power supply for the real-time clock generator? I didn't expect that. Tantalum capacitors usually just explode leaving you with a shorter hardware, but this was very unusual and exciting case for me. I hope you feel the same, and I'd be very glad to have you on my channel again. Please don't forget to like, dislike, write your comments and share my channel if you like to. I would very much appreciate your help, feedback and support. So far, thank you and goodbye.